Yeah, I was also asked just to give a short um, presentation to you for about five minutes just with a, an idea or view or observation on free speech. I'm a passionate um, believer in free speech but also accept what Lorraine quite properly said that um, everyone accepts and passionately advocates for free speech until it comes down to the hard grey areas of drawing the lines and the exceptions around it. But one um, issue that has been rattling around in my mind over the last um, several weeks is with respect to the very tragic death of um, Chris Evans, the late US ambassador to Libya. And of course, in Australia, as in the USA and Britain, there's never been a guarantee of an immunity which allows citizens to simply say absolutely anything they want at any time. That's never been the case. Uh, if you shout fire in a crowded theatre or ring up an airline and say you've planted a bomb on the plane, you're likely to get, erected, uh, likely to get um, arrested and, you know, frankly, you should be arrested if you do such things. Uh, you can't criminally defame someone. Um, governments can and do censor articles about troop movements or national security issues. Um, governments prevent the airing of material deemed morally repugnant, such as stories or pictures of child pornography or bestiality, and that was an issue that our parliament has dealt with over the last several months. Uh, and of course, a very important exception is that you cannot say words which incite another to commit a criminal offence, which has been a long um, offence at common law uh, and in the code, in this code jurisdiction. But falling short, obviously, of that inciting provision, uh, which I'll just call sedition for, for summary sake, that inciting another by your words to actually commit a criminal offence is what has commonly now become known as hate speech, if you like. Things which can't objectively be viewed as an, an outright objective um, inciting of another person to commit a criminal offence, but which are um, vile, nasty and hateful. Um, particularly with the rise of anonymous comment on the Sunday Times website and other places, I've had a fair bit of that myself over the last little while, but um, that's what you learn to live with as a politician. But um, if you want to define hate speech as material designed to incite hatred and vilify individual people or groups on the basis of their race, gender, religion or sexual orientation, I'm sure few people in this room would disagree with the proposition that, that such speech is terrible. Um, but is also, of course, speech which in many instances is free and um, sits and resides around the value that we hold as free speech. And the producers of incendiary, hateful material such as that um, have long been able to peddle their wares without the threat of censorship from any soapbox that they so chose. Um, over the years, the line drawing question for parliaments has been, I think, largely in this area around what is an incitement to a criminal offence and what is just nastiness. And where do you draw that line in what sometimes becomes quite a grey area? But having watched the terrible events unfold recently after the um, airing on YouTube and, and Google of the, um, the, the film with which we're all familiar um, depicting the Prophet Muhammad, I think the new distinction, which now is going to complicate this matter even further, is that line between the voice and the megaphone, um, the words and the medium in which the words are expressed, the primary saying of the, the free speech words and the technology employed to spread those said words around the world and, and now very, very quickly. And President Obama recently said the strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech. I wonder, whilst um, sympathetic to that view, whether or not that is not engaging in a little bit of wishful thinking. I think neither the makers of that anti-Muslim film nor the Islamic agitators who are firing up mobs from Tunis to Islamabad are susceptible to rational suasion. They're simply not. Um, no amount of free, free speech is going to calm that scenario down. They're in the business of inciting hatred and causing conflict. And um, from that perspective, that video has been an enormous and tragic success. Um, as excessive and outrageous as the response was, it was clearly predictable. And the fact of the predictability is something that all governments will have to deal with. Um, the modern difference now is that 10 years ago, there was no mechanism for the wide dissemination and viewing of a hate speech in a film like that. Uh, you could get on your soapbox and say the things that were contained in that film, or indeed make the film, but no one would hear it or see it other than your crazy mates. Uh, but now with YouTube and Google, uh, thousands, millions of people can see it almost instantly. Um, again, President Obama's view on this, it appears that the rise of the internet and mobile phones makes it pointless to even try and do anything about that situation. I'm not sure how convincing that argument is. Uh, what caused those riots was the dissemination of the spoken words. And new media companies like Google, which owns YouTube and Facebook, 
can't effectively in the United States be forced to take that material down. Arguably, if they were resident um, and had their genesis in other jurisdictions pursuant to those grey lines I talked about earlier, they may have been compelled to take that material down. But one very interesting point that I'll leave you with before introducing the speakers is this, is that Google said that they would not take down uh, that film uh, from YouTube, which they own, because it did not violate YouTube's terms of service which ban hate speech targeted at individuals but not at groups. That's what Google said. But when you actually read the terms of service, which are interesting to read, and I did after hearing Google say that, that's not what the terms of service actually say. Uh, they say that users agree not to submit any content that is contrary to the YouTube community guidelines, and those guidelines read as follows. We encourage free speech and defend everyone's right to express unpopular points of view, but we don't permit hate speech, speech which attacks or demeans a group, based on race or ethnic origin, religion, disability, gender, age, veteran status, and sexual orientation, gender, and identity. So by broadcasting and uploading that onto YouTube, Google was violating its own charter. And it simply did not tell the truth when it said that it was not violating its own charter by disseminating that material. Now, maybe affecting the mechanism of the promotion of the free speech uh, is so closely aligned with the fact of the free speech itself that having rules that would stop Google from uploading the information uh, in itself is a violation of free speech. That, that may well be the case. But I think that that's something now that as a society and as governments we will all have to grapple with. Uh, it may be that stopping the person using a megaphone of their choice is, a, is the equivalent of stopping them from speaking, of actually putting a gag over their mouth, or maybe it's not. Uh, but I think that's something that we're all going to have to consider going forward. I don't have any answers, but that's my five-minute observation, uh, which then brings me to the first speaker today, and I have bios for everyone. And the first speaker is Mr Stephen Herworth, who studied liberal arts at the University of Cape Town in his native South Africa and is also a graduate, a graduate of Charles Sturt University, where he studied learning technologies. Combining a love of classics with technology, Stephen and his wife Catherine established St Augustine's Classical Christian College, initially as a private tutoring college in Perth in 2008. Stephen's main focus at the moment is developing an alternative classical Christian curriculum mapped to the national curriculum. He is in agreement with John Howard that not teaching young Australians a healthy appreciation of their past will lead to a lack of national self-confidence. Stephen believes that this would make young Australians less prepared for the more competitive global environment which they are likely to inherit. And with those words, with which I firmly agree, I'd like to welcome Stephen to make his contribution. few jokes already so I might as well continue that tradition and um, <clears throat> I'm sure that most of you can help David at his awkward moment on Letterman when he was asked about the meaning of Magna Carta and uh, this has been uh, a useful bit of ammunition for his rival uh, within the um, uh, Conservative Party potentially uh, Boris Johnson uh, who sort of lampooned him a few days ago about his Latin knowledge and said that um, he should remember because they studied Latin together at at Eton, as I understand. And um, I suppose that's a more lighthearted look at what the Prime Minister was talking about uh, in terms of um, the cost of historical amnesia. Um, but I thought that that introduction to the uh, Sir Paul Hasluck Foundation was of singular importance because uh, the extract that I put up there really talks about uh, this idea of achieving the right balance in the way in which we teach uh, Western civilization uh, in the context of uh, the school system that, that I work in. Uh, and Howard's comments are quite nuanced. He, um, he qualified what he was saying. And you can see over there he talks about um, more this tendency to marginalize the historic influence of the Judeo-Christian ethic uh, in shaping uh, Australian society and, um, and purging British history from its meaningful role. And then he also goes on just to talk about um, the uh, importance of indigenous history and Asian history, and, uh, but those can be treated in a way that still recognizes the unique role of Western civilization uh, in Australia's formation. And I think that you can't really have a conference on freedom of speech without looking at the distinctives of uh, Western civilization uh, in regard to freedom of speech. And I will t touch on the thorny um, question of the Islamic world and, and the race between the Islamic world and Western civilization in a few comments about 
about history because I think that uh, understanding history correctly could give us a new paradigm with which uh, to work with uh, different civilizations. If we understand our own civilization correctly, we're more likely to avoid making the mistakes uh, of the past. And um, so let's have a look at a little bit of an example um, about the importance of this issue of relativism. So I thought I would take a quote from um, <clears throat> Pope Benedict uh, from a book called Without Roots, The West, Relativism, uh, Christianity and Islam. And in this extract, Pope Benedict talks about uh, the comparison between today's situation and the late Roman Empire, which is one of my favorite topics, and some of my students who've endured that will know that I tend to go on about it from time to time. Uh, but in this collection of essays, he talks about the necessity to uh, understand uh, the right framework for a healthy civilization. And he talks about the historical framework. And um, in the last days of the Roman Empire, Rome still functioned as a great historical framework, but in practice it was already subsisting on models that were destined to fail. And I wonder if that isn't the case with some of our uh, Western models at the moment uh, in the context of this issue of freedom of speech and multiculturalism, whether we haven't created something that's not really uh, sustainable. Uh, so <clears throat> as this, the old classical Christian culture has disappeared uh, and we've had a number of new uh, models for our society that have developed uh, over the last centuries uh, and in the last um, period of time since the Second World War we've had uh, more social engineering projects like the welfare state that seem to be sort of no disrespect to uh, to the, uh, the Europeans here, but there seem to be uh, there seem to be a lot of uh, frayed edges in a lot of these uh, models at the moment. And uh, we've got quite uh, close friends who spend a lot of time in Greece, and certainly uh, from their experiences in Greece at the moment. Uh, and it's very much, uh, if you like my Greek uh, pillars at the on the first slide, it's very much. Uh, quite symbolically important in a way that the economic crisis in Greece is also, I think, a crisis in our own civilizational self-confidence. Um, so if the West no longer believes in the moral legitimacy of its own civilization, it will most likely um, suffer a correction at some point from another civilization. I think that this is uh, starting to occur with uh, some of the conflicts that are going on with uh, the Islamic world, and I'm going to argue that uh, under a correct understanding of history will actually lead to better relations with the Islamic world rather than worse relations. Um, but I'll give you an example of how not to do it from the national curriculum. But this idea of, I want to touch on this idea of multiculturalism. So depending how you define multiculturalism, uh, which is so constantly and passionately promoted, uh, as Pope Bendix says, can sometimes amount to an abandonment and denial, a flight from one's own heritage, but it cannot survive without common foundations, without a sense of direction offered by our own values. So that's really, in many ways, what comes up within those limits of freedom of speech. When is it irresponsible or responsible to, um, and which boundaries uh, do we set? Uh, and uh, the YouTube example is an interesting one because, of course, that's global. So in a sense, uh, what did happen, I know in a number of cases, that uh, Google had different uh, policies for different countries. So in a lot of the Islamic countries, that video was taken down. Um, so in a sense, that recognized the different ways in which uh, religious vilification is interpreted uh, in different countries. Um, so what should we be learning then about our own history, and particularly our history um, in this uh, context of different civilizations. And I've taken an example from year eight history studies, which is mentioned briefly in one of the IPA um, uh, papers as well, which looks at the Western and Islamic worlds. And I'll just touch briefly on it because Byzantine studies is one of my favorite areas. And uh, I think it's very important to study the Ottoman Empire. But this little example just illustrates the, um, the way in which the, uh, the material is, is treated. So for example, uh, it says, describe the way in which it was the power and responsibility of the Sultan to ensure that justice was served within society, and then outline the millet system, which was uh, a way in which non-Muslim peoples were treated during the Ottoman Empire, so specifically the uh, Armenian Orthodox, the Greeks, of course, and also Jews and other minorities. And then um, it talks about uh, under the fall of Constantinople uh, as a considered intercultural understanding, which I thought was a bit um, not exactly the way it would have been seen, I'm sure, on either side at the time. Um, and well, let's have a look at an example uh, in, uh, in currently what's happening and 
is I don't necessarily agree with some of the statements. I'm just putting out some of the debate at the moment. Recently in Afghanistan, we've had a lot of Australian soldiers killed in Afghanistan. And uh, is there something that you know, we can learn from history that would help us to have a more effective policy in Afghanistan? So the Prime Minister says our strategy is well defined, it is constant. We cannot allow even the most grievous of losses to change our strategy. We went there for a purpose, we'll see that purpose through. Uh, but I don't know very many people that really believe that that strategy is working effectively. According to Mark Dewey, who's an expert on Indonesian history, he talks about this, um, the Archonese insurgency that happened in Indonesia in the late 1800s under the Dutch colonial government uh, when they were subjected to a lot of these, um, <clears throat> these green on blue attacks. And they only really were able to get the situation under control in terms of military history once they actually looked at um, the militant, um, history of militant Muslim groups using particular tactics. Um, and most of the Dutch soldiers were killed by their own Archonese soldiers who they trained themselves. Um, and uh, it was only by adopting their strategy that they were able to uh, successfully bring the situation under control. So that's an example of, uh, of history. And let's look at Afghanistan. And uh, Edward Lutwak, author of The Grand Strategy of the Byzantine Empire, uh, talks about, um, I suppose, uh, rather learning from the Byzantine experience in, in this long conflict with the Turkish uh, in that, that period of conflict with the Ottoman Empire. And he says that with Afghanistan, the West faces a simple strategic calculus, too costly to stay in, too risky to leave. The Byzantine response would be first to withdraw the West's scarce expensive troops and arm local proxies instead. This was the standard remedy for turbulent, worthless lands where no taxes could be collected, but which were to be denied to enemies and improvement over the Romans' fondness for battles of attrition and annihilation, which I thought was very relevant to I think what is the failure of Western strategy in, in Afghanistan, looking at it from the perspective of, of military history. Um, so hopefully that, that's just really to give you an idea of, um, uh, of some of the consequences of teaching history, because a lot of people say, well, what does it really matter what we learn about the Ottoman Empire? It's not really relevant to us today. But um, history does repeat itself. Uh, and as uh, Howard quoted Churchill as saying, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think that if we actually learn from history, we'll have a better, um, we'll be able to relate better to the Islamic world by, by being more honest about the differences between our civilization uh, and theirs. Um, and I think um, <clears throat> part of what is important in the teaching of history, um, and what I really want to focus on, is this whole idea of uh, deregulation of education and looking at uh, diversity in the curriculum and the, role, the way in which the diversity in the curriculum uh, can uh, promote uh, liberty at home. So if not learning the mistakes of history has consequences in foreign policy, it also has consequences in, um, in learning uh, in terms of domestic affairs and not learning uh, the lessons of history for our own internal relations. Um, so I wanted to look at this idea of the national curriculum and um, the concept of a national curriculum and really argue uh, the case as to whether we really need to have a, an overarching uh, curriculum. Previously, we had a curriculum framework that was a much better model, in my view, because the framework basically allowed different groups to have a number of different perspectives um, and to have, uh, it was much easier to map to the curriculum framework uh, than it is now to map to the national curriculum. Um, so if we're going to have a historical meta-narrative and be able to really have one that works cohesively for a society that is um, uh, multi-ethnic uh, and is, has attracted people from all different parts of the world, then we need to also be able to obviously select what sort of history are we going to put together, what sort of curriculum are we going to put together to uh, enable that uh, civilization to be in a, a more competitive state and for us not to be embarrassed about uh, Western civilization, but rather see it as something that is worth celebrating. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, could be done, uh, which could be very successful in promoting uh, these, um, the health of our own civilization, a Western civilization, is just getting out um, the meta narrative uh, that acknowledges um, the, the way in which the rule of law, uh, property rights, freedom of religion have developed uh, in our own civilization. Uh, for example, um, former Prime Minister Howard talked about the English Civil War and things like that, which are very much about this issue of religion and state and how they work together. Um, and that's something that in the classical model students learn, and I'll go through some examples of books that 
uh, students will uh, go through when they do the, the classical Christian curriculum. Uh, but if we're going to get uh, real reform in the curriculum, real reform with a national curriculum, um, it needs to be done on the basis of curriculum diversity. My own view is it's very unlikely that we're going to get um, agreement on any national curriculum. It's always, you're never going to please everyone. There are always going to be particular vested interests that are going to push a particular barrow in terms of their national curriculum. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, in Australia, uh, we have quite limited options uh, in terms of curriculum diversity. So uh, this is really partly because of the structure of the education system. So although uh, in the UK, for example, so if you are able to afford to go to Eton or Marlborough, those sort of schools, rugby and so on, um, you'll basically have a choice of, uh, in the areas of curriculum and the way the schools are run, uh, that's different to what would be the case in, our, in an Ivy League school in Australia because in the UK those schools are completely private. They basically have a lot more freedom to run their own affairs. Uh, in Australia, your choices that are put up there, it's non-government funded private schools. Uh, you can do homeschooling if you're really radical uh, or you can um, uh, basically uh, join me and argue the case for another sector of education that's private schools that do run uh, independently and don't necessarily need to rely on, on funding. Um, so I think that um, I'll turn to an example from the UK. Let's keep on that uh, example. So recently there was a bit of a controversy when uh, Tony Little, the uh, headmaster at Eton College, said that teacher training colleges make people worse teachers rather than better teachers. And people got very upset. Um, in a Spectator article, it said, Little regularly appoints those who have not been through the vacuous propaganda of the teacher training colleges. And there's a bit of a hoo-ha about that. Um, but the point was really the issue of regulation and uh, an over-control of, of the private school system uh, in Australia, I think, is something that's uh, been overlooked to a large extent. And I, I really hope that, um, certainly in the political arena, that uh, there'd be more of a case for curriculum deregulation and uh, allowing alternative curriculums uh, to develop. So um, partly this is obviously the relation between funding and control of the curriculum that operates uh, in the Australian educational system um, and the way in which that, uh, that has come together historically. So initially the Catholic sector uh, in the 70s put a case, a very convincing case, that your taxes should come back uh, through private education and be used for, um, for curriculum uh, so that your taxes came back effectively through the funding of private education. What's tended to happen though is that uh, the National Curriculum is a good example as the funding has moved, uh, because the government funding is related so closely to the curriculum in the Australian system, it does tend to uh, be part of the package. So there's not as much uh, choice in uh, curriculum as there is in, uh, in the UK system. Um, so one of the things that uh, is creating opportunities, though, is uh, the, the uh, financial crisis in Europe has led uh, uh, some European governments. So uh, in Sweden, for example, they're now allowing private for-profit companies to run schools, and they're also deregulating the curriculum in a number of European countries and allowing uh, much more freedom. Um, the alternative curriculums that we have uh, in Australia at the moment, there's the International Baccalaureate, so some of you may well have come through that system, a Swiss system that uh, basically was developed in the 1960s originally, and uh, that provides uh, a different curriculum pathway uh, in Australia. Uh, also Montessori and Steiner are other alternative curriculums that have been developed, uh, which are, were uh, approved last year, mapped to the um, to their own curriculum framework. So they are alternatives to the national curriculum that you can do to study um, uh, different uh, curriculums. So that important distinction between a framework and a curriculum, in the framework you can uh, go through a process of mapping. If it's a curriculum, then it's prescribed uh, content. Um, so I want to look at this uh, issue of um, what should a free society, what should children in a free society actually be learning at school, and then what sort of uh, curriculum, what would that curriculum actually look like? And I think that um, partly this is uh, something that's coming to fashion through <coughs> uh, more recently uh, because of the uh, decision to bring in the national curriculum and then the reaction to that which has come about in a number of different uh, forms. And I want to talk a bit about the um, 
uh, the way in which uh, Indigenous and also Australian history, um, Asian history, sorry, is taught uh, in our curriculum. So uh, one of the things that we do is emphasize the um, importance of uh, European culture being taught, of Australian culture and European culture's long relationship and the way in which um, that relationship is expressed through events like the spice trade, so we emphasize economic liberty. We tie that uh, process together uh, into um, a number of different areas. Um, in terms of the Anglo-Celtic heritage, we teach the importance of, of that, why that still matters. We also teach uh, the Bible as the sacred text of the West and why that's important. I think one of the things that really does matter in terms of this debate of freedom of speech is the freedom to persuade people as to your point of view. Um, and why your point of view is the right point of view. There have been some very bad examples of freedom of speech that we've looked at, but I think the fundamental um, freedom that comes through uh, in the classical Christian approach is that idea of persuasion uh, and being able to, um, to learn uh, from the great conversation of the past. So the Bible's taught as a sacred text of Western civilization, and this recognizes the fact that although the West um, is, has never been completely Christian, it does have a unique relationship with Christianity that uh, other civilizations do not have. So the New Testament, for example, is written in Greek predominantly. Um, Christ was born under the reign of Caesar Augustus. Christianity spread globally by means of the European empires. And it's no accident that Christianity does well in the West. It is uh, based very much around the idea of being able to uh, persuade people of the truth of your position. And I think part of the appeal of uh, the classical Christian worldview is this idea of, uh, of persuasion and learning about the roots of it. Uh, in the, um, the early part of what we, of what we study, uh, we look at uh, ancient Egypt, uh, the Old Testament period, Greece and Rome through to the medieval period. And one of the things that you do notice about the Greeks is the uniqueness of Greek civilization in terms of the way in which the Greeks uh, were able to accept different points of view without those different points of view being um, leading to conflict necessarily. You had different schools of philosophy in Athens. You could be satirized uh, by Aristophanes, for example, in your plays, uh, in his plays, and that was accepted as a legitimate part of, of Greek culture. Um, so the sort of things that students will study, um, in the classical model, students study the uh, Christian classics, but also the pagan classics, and they study um, over 240 books over the, the last seven years of their study. That's the main part of the, uh, the distinctives of the alternative curriculum. And those, that period includes ancient Egypt, uh, Hebrew history, pagan and Byzantine Greece, uh, the New Testament and Roman history, uh, and all the way through the Renaissance, Reformation, and through to the modern period. So over this time of, of six years, uh, students basically get through um, an enormous amount of material. And by grappling with some of these complex questions about human existence, classical Christian students deal with real questions about life, justice, and the nature of truth. Understanding the development of the concept of free speech is as important to the classical Christian curriculum as understanding the roots of classical music or the establishment of the concepts of economic liberty. Uh, other things that students learn, an emphasis on excellence in English, including classical writing, uh, the Shakespeare canon, logic and rhetoric, uh, technology and entrepreneurship, as well as political liberty and the foundations of political liberty. Um, and although this model is indigenous to the West, it's very attractive. Uh, we have a lot of queries from places like Singapore, uh, also a relationship with a small school in the Republic of Mauritius. Um, because classical Christian education is not, it's not a reactionary type of education, it's very much more uh, about being proactive and really representing the best of the West and distilling that into a way that makes sense for Australians. And uh, John Howard picked that up uh, quite well in his talk. Um, so what sort of things would you study? Um, sorry? 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, so just to, uh, to finish off, what sort of things would you study? Well, I've taken a few things out of this period from year seven to eight, for example. So students study the Bible, uh, the whole Bible. They also study um, primary readers in year seven. Uh, for example, you can see there, Codes of Hammurabi and Moses, uh, etc. I'll let you read through those and, um, and really that, that's probably the core of what we do and we're finding that that's something that's uh, just a little bit different. It's a bit of a niche that um, 
is filling a, a bit of a gap in the market of education at the moment. And by the time students come through that, they've really got a small education ready in one course uh, that enables them to participate in the great conversation, uh, so to speak. Um, so I think that uh, if you want to um, understand the purpose of it, I've just got a quote from Herodotus about the Athenians from his book, <coughs> The Histories. And he talks about how the Athenians had increased in strength, which demonstrates that an equal voice in government has beneficial impact, not merely in one way, but in every way. The Athenians, while ruled by tyrants, were no better in war than any of the peoples living around them. But once they were rid of the tyrants, they became by far the best of all. And he's talking about um, this change in human behavior once people are entitled to take responsibility for themselves and, um, and what happened historically with the Persian Wars. So, and I've ended up with a quote, a few quotes here from scripture as well about uh, the tradition of excellence and also this idea of law, that law leads to liberty and, and really the point of persuasion, uh, which is so fundamental. So there's, nothing, there's no freedom more valuable than the freedom to actually choose your own belief system. And I think that's the, probably the fundamental freedom that um, probably most social conservatives uh, in the Christian tradition would see as a sacred freedom, is that uh, ability to make up your own mind about what you really believe about life. And that, that to me is a responsible use of our liberties. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Christian. And